everybody. We're um, we're just here this evening, and we wanted to do a little jam session, and uh, we thought that we would record it and allow y'all to be a part of it. Um, it's going to be really relaxed. Some we may do a little bit of talking in between. Um, really relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't practiced very much. Thankfully, Nate is a very talented and uh, capable musician. Poor thing. We've <laughs> sent him all kinds of songs and changed songs on him, and he's just picked right up. So we're thankful. Um, uh, but tonight as we do this, um, I know we say it's relaxed and, you know, sit, sit back and enjoy. But tonight I also want to invite you to get up and worship if you want to do that, if you feel compelled. Um, just stand if you want to and raise your hands just like we're in a church service. Um, allow... God can move anywhere. And, you know, it's, it's kind of getting to the point that it's a little bit rough us all being um, safe inside of our homes, you know, is how we're trying to think of it, but as, at the same time, we miss being together. So this is what we have right now. So I pray that um, this would be a blessing to you and that um, you would just enjoy and, and look over our mistakes and just have a mm -hmm. good time with us tonight. Sorry? Yeah. God sent his son <laughs> they
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lordy, bay out was rough. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't as good. I'm going to have to pull one, please. That one here, how many do you want? Please. Here, I got to get it on, too. It's, you know, just like we're at the house. <laughs> <laughs>
again And I don't need to keep on hiding I'm falling up And love by you You won't let go No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's hard to and ridiculous phrase to be known so much.
of Life Worship Center. Glad you're with us this evening. Uh, we just wanted to come on this Wednesday evening and give you a little bit of music and uh, acoustic style, and we want to thank those that just uh, was able to do that. But then I wanted to also come on and do a little short devotion with you guys tonight for our Wednesday night service. But um, I want to stick on the topic of grace. I want to kind of pick up where we let where we left off, and I want to start out tonight by reading. John chapter 1, 
or John, first John chapter two, verse one through 11 says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I've said this many times and through this little series that we've done, and I'll say it again, many believers we are living a mediocre life because we have failed to under, understand the subject of grace. I believe grace is such a powerful subject that if we as believers truly grasp it, it will revolutionize our life and it will change our relationship with Jesus Christ. But one thing you and I have to come to grips with is that we are in a battle with sin. We cannot get away from it. We are in a battle with sin. In fact, Paul said that it's a constant battle, flesh versus spirit. So I want to kind of define the goals of the enemy and what we can do about sin. Because anybody that has ever made a mistake in their life, there is great hope for you today. And I hope this, this devotion, this message will show you visually the authority that you have as a believer, the right that you have as a believer, and the identity that you have as a believer. But one thing we have to understand is when we commit a sin, we need to rebound. We need to recover quickly. We don't just need to lay in our sin. So what do we do when we sin? What do we do? I just said, the first thing we need to do is we need to rebound. We need to recover quickly. Remember our definition of God's grace. We have said it several times here in the last couple of weeks, but it's God's unmerited, unearned, and undeserved favor. So thinking of it that way, let's look at the, the, the goal of sin, the goal of our enemy. What does the enemy try to do with sin in our lives? What is the goal of sin in our life? What was the serpent trying to do with Adam and Eve? Sin tries to separate us from the things of God. The serpent tried to separate Adam and Eve from the things of God. Don't believe what God has said. Don't hang out with God. Stay here with me and hang out with me at this tree. And what happens is, is we put ourselves in the position to be tempted instead of being with God at the tree of life. So the enemy tries to fill the believers with guilt, with shame, with condemnation. He tries to keep believers from spending quality time with God. The enemy tries to push us as believers away from the church and from the, the fellowship of other believers. And if he can do that and get us by himself, he will get us in the middle of that garden and he will trick us. So understand this today. The goal of sin is to separate you from the things of God. The goal of sin is to distract you from your purpose. David was distracted by Bathsheba. Samson was distracted by Delilah. Jonah was distracted by fear. And what Satan tries to do is wrap you in sin and put you off course. And if he can pull you off course, it brings us to another goal of sin. He hinders our prayers. You see, when, when I have a need, when I have a need, when I try to go to God, 
this uh, with the prayer of my need. The very first thing the enemy tries to do when I go to prayer, and I'm sure many of you are the same way, but the very first thing he does is he tries to take my mind to my very last sin, to the thing that I did, and he begins to try to replay that over and over and over in my mind while I'm trying to pray, and lies begin to come, and he's, he's in my ear, and he is saying, God doesn't want to talk to you. God doesn't want to spend time with you. He doesn't want to answer your prayer because you've not been good enough. You remember that sin that you just committed. You remember how you treated someone unfairly. You remember how you did this or you did that. But that's what the enemy does. And that is the goal of sin. That's what it wants to do. But I want you to read Proverbs with me. It says, listen, my son, accept what I say and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Then James in the New Testament says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So the goal of sin is to separate you from the things of God, to distract you from your purpose, to hinder your prayers, and to keep you tied to the law. The thought that comes is, you blew it. Now I have to earn my way back to God. Well, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I think it was in chapter 15, he said, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. So think about that. When you live under the law, it only leads to more sin. And you go through that constant cycle of repetitive behavior. I sin. I have guilt. I have shame. I try to do good. Then I sin, and then I have guilt, and then I have shame, and then I try to do good. And that cycle, that repetitive cycle is completely going on in my life. But look what Paul says in Romans. And I want to read from the message in chapter 7. Paul said, I decide to do good, but I really, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decision, decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's command, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect that they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Paul said that Jesus Christ acted to set things right in this world of contradictions. Romans 8 and 6 says, The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So another goal uh, uh, of sin is to lead me into more sin. The devil is extremely patient, church. He is extremely patient. How long did it take Adam and Eve to get to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? No one truly knows. It could have been it could have been years, it could have been decades, but we don't truly know. But he starts with a small sin that leads to another and another and another until it comes becomes a life altering sin. And what I mean by that is no one in kindergarten woke up this morning and says, I want to be a homeless drug addict. No one woke up at a young age and said that this morning. But people get there by repetitive sin after repetitive sin. Proverbs 4 says, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, ever or shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. What happens if I blindfold somebody and try to tell them to run a race? It's hard to run a race blindfolded and in the darkness. 
And when we choose a life of sin, it leads to more sin because we are not living in the light. So understand that. So to understand, we just saw the goal of sin. But I also said at the very beginning that when we do sin, we need to rebound and we need to recover quickly because we have all made mistakes. How do we turn around? First John chapter one says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Now, think about this. Don't give your sin another name. That's the world we're living in. Nobody wants to call sin, sin. Sin is sin. Don't give it another name. Don't call it your weakness. Don't call it your vulnerabilities. Don't call it your struggle. Call it what it is. It's sin in your life. If it looks like sin, if it walks like sin, if it quacks like sin, it's sin. Sin is sin, and there is there is not mediocre sin and light sin and th this little sin. Sin is sin, it's, and sin is disobedience to God. So call it what it is, whatever it may be in your life. Call it what it is, sin. Again, it's not your weakness. It's not your vulnerabilities. It's not your struggle. It is sin. Call it sin. Remember, God loves you. God is not mad at you. God is not asking you to go to the penalty box because you committed sin. Understand that this morning. He, his love endures forever. That is quoted 33 times in Psalms. Psalms 103, verse 8 through 12. Look at this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he, will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So be quick to repent. Make it right now. I know what that is? It's a leech. And a leech will grow larger and larger as long as you allow it to stay attached. That is the way sin is. The longer you leave sin in your life, the more it will suck out of you. What would you do if you had red ants swarming on your leg? You get them off quickly. You rinse, you run, you do all that stuff. Why don't we do that with sin? Some of us, some of you, you let sin remain and you bask in it. Confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Listen to me today. Embrace the power of grace. Jesus paid the price for every sin that you will ever commit and every sin you have committed. Titus 3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by, grace, by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. I just, just said that we have been justified by his grace. I had an old preacher used to say all the time, justified just as if I'd never sinned. 
Paul said in Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Wake up to righteousness. Wake up to righteousness. We need to wake up to God's love, God's mercy, His grace, His righteousness. We need to be in right standing with God. Paul went on to say in Romans 5, for just as through the disobedience of one man, the, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. Wake up to righteousness. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, he says, Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your chain. The New King James Version says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The Message Version says, Think straight. Awaken to the holiness of life. No more playing fast and loose with resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford to miss in times like this. Times like these. Think about that. Satan wants you to look at yourself as a muddy mess. When God looks at you, you need to understand that he sees the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And you will become dangerous to the enemy when you know your righteous rights, when you know how to combat sin. And when you understand the topic of grace, you have to see yourself through the lens of grace and you have to see other people the same way. Proverbs 28 and 1 says, the wicked man flees, no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Zechariah 3 says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Another version says, I will dress you in priestly clothes. God isn't going to dress you based on your works. God is going to dress you based on what Jesus Christ did. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. James says in chapter 2, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what, what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what? He did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Faith, acting on what we believe. How do I live my life according to who God says I am? 
If I told you right now that in your living room, wherever you're at right now, I hid a hundred dollar bill under one of your recliners or under one of your couches or one of your tables. If you believed me, you would take action and you would search for that hundred dollar bill. That's exactly what faith is. Faith is our response to God's word. <coughs> Excuse me. I believe my sins are forgiven, so I don't live in guilt and shame. I believe that I am a child of God, so I act like I'm one of his kids. I believe the word of God says that I am dead to sin, so I act like I'm dead to sin. Paul said, I think it was in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, what fellowship can light have with darkness? Pastor, what are you saying? What if, what if it was a sin to eat pizza? Let's just go here. Should a righteous man go to a pizza joint? Should a righteous man be around people that are eating pizza? Should a righteous man be around pizza regularly? When you realize who you are, you will not want to go near sin. You will want to be with other people that shine the light of Christ. Is there sin in your life? <coughs> God wants to make you free. He wants to set you free. You see, sin in your life does not define you. God's word defines you this evening. Your sin is not who you are. Jesus said, I have made you who you are. So my prayer tonight is that you will ask the Father, that you would ask God to fill you with his spirit more and more every day, that God would give you more power more and more every day. And I close with this scripture. Paul said in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardships or persecutions or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. My prayer tonight for everyone. If you're here and you're lost and you don't know Christ, my prayer is that I that you would surrender your life to Jesus Christ. My prayer to the church is that you would surrender your life to Jesus Christ, that we would become more aware of our sin and not bask in it and lay in it, that we would quickly rebound from it. Understand what the, the goal of sin is. Understand what the goal uh, uh, of our enemy is. He wants to separate us from the things of God. He wants to distract us from our purpose. He wants to hinder our prayers. He wants to keep you and me tied to the law and lead us into more sin. And I'm asking you tonight to repent. I believe that's where God has brought us as America. Now I believe that's where God has brought us as a church, that it's time to repent of our sins and experience the powerful grace of God. I love you. God bless you. We glad you're here. Hope to see you online with us on Sunday morning at 1045.